Sheet that's going around. Um, if it doesn't get to you, make sure you stick around after and get it signed so that those get reported back to the sport administrators. Um, make sure our head coaches you make us aware. Um, if anyone on your staff is not in attendance, the reason why, make sure they watch the video that we're recording. Um, got the agendas going around, so uh, you can get those. Um, actually, Okay, so um, obviously right now the most topical thing to talk about in compliance is what happened at the convention. Um, and Mr. Krimal in my staff meeting last week gave you a primer about what was anticipated and what things might happen. And then of course he was at the convention. Um, and now um, of course the first thing to say is any action taken at the convention um, was taken for the 65 autonomous institutions. So mm -hmm. these are not rules going into effect for <laughs> us, but they were voted really on and approved. And you know, of course, the way things work right now is they decide things, and then we, the rest of us, respond. So it is important to know what they're doing, even if these aren't necessarily rules for us at this moment. Um, so uh, the. Most significant thing uh, I'm sure everyone knows about is that the full cost of attendance proposal passed. Um, now, there were a whole bunch of different specific proposals about full cost of attendance and how it would be implemented. Um, they didn't really go through all of those proposals. Um, so all that's clear at this point is that they have passed full cost of attendance, but um, they kind of didn't exactly do the process how it was supposed to happen. Big surprise. Um, and so we don't have a lot of details about it at this point. So I put an NCA statement for you and you can see how ambiguous it is. Uh, the NCA tells us, as expected, members have raised questions about the application of the new rule and we recognize the need to provide appropriate direction to help all Division I conferences and institutions in their decision making. To that end, we will move quickly to provide an additional question and answer document to address the questions that we have heard, which of course they haven't provided at this time. Um, so um, the biggest question in all of it is, uh, which is still unclear, is how equivalencies are going to be calculated, um, taking into account full cost of attendance. Um, of course, I don't have answers for you on that. Um, and it's still unclear if we, everyone not in the autonomous 65, um, unclear if we're going to be permitted to choose a middle ground or if it's just one or the other, go to what they're doing or not. We were led to believe all along that we could go part way and not do exactly what they're doing, but there is some question about if actually we're going to be allowed to do that. So a lot of questions up in the air about full cost of attendance. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of media reports about it. Like I said, the staff meeting. We'll try to keep you as informed as possible. Um, you know, there are a lot of questions. I don't have answers because the NCA doesn't have answers at this point. So, um, you know, we'll keep you in the loop as best as possible. Uh, the concussion protocol passed, um, but it was amended since the staff meeting last week and before the weekend vote. Um, it was amended outside of the legislative process again. Surprise, surprise, that it didn't exactly follow procedure, but it was amended to no longer contain the provision of the monthly girls. It still has the requirement of, if you are considered a high-risk <coughs> sport, doing a preseason um, run-through of your concussion protocol, um, but it takes out the monthly. Um, and so at this point, um, our legal counsel, as well as legal counsel of pretty much every Division One institution um, and the NCA are uh, reviewing um, you know, what's going to be officially established, if anything, as best practices, and um, if we should adopt the same policy that they're doing, which, um, of course, indications are no one wants to not do something uh, that's considered medical, because it seems like you are not fulfilling your medical obligations as students. On the other side, of course, there's 
costs and a time component to um, devote to this program. So um, unclear still what we will be doing, but uh, that one did pass. Um, the other significant one that's gotten a lot of media attention is the quote unquote guaranteed scholarships which passed. Um, the one that, of course, they're not fully guaranteed, but um, that an uh, athletic grant aid cannot be non-renewed for athletic purposes, whatever that means. Um, but here at SFU, we already offer multi-year grant aids to any student athlete who receives athletic grant aid, so really um, shouldn't mean anything regardless of what, um, obviously this is just the 65, but regardless of what the rest of Division One does, we already offer, um, so don't see it really affecting us. Um, and the surprising thing to note uh, in this, in the deliberations, was that um, some of the student athletes, um, and you know, it's the 65 institutions plus 15 student athletes make up the 80 person vote. Um, so it was uh, some of the student athletes raising dissent against this, um, kind of saying that, trying to hold their teammates, trying to hold people accountable, saying um, they don't want to be on a team with people who know that their scholarship is guaranteed and the aren't putting in the work. Um, obviously, you know, there are counter arguments as well. Um, and it was a student athlete who pointed out that um, they come to school as student athletes, their academic um, being able to earn a degree should be above all else. So uh, obviously that passed. It's just interesting to see uh, some of the debate that the student athletes had, uh, given that they had a seat at the table. So um, that's the big things that came out of this weekend. Um, uh, in terms of actions taken. Um, of course, there's a whole bunch of other NCAA governance things going on, committees being <laughs> toured and dissolved and all of that politicking. Uh, but does anyone have any questions about any of these measures? Um, anything you may have heard or want clarity on at this time? <coughs> Kevin, is there an expectation that there's an answer going to be in place before the <coughs> crop of incoming freshmen <coughs> arrive on campus, just from a recruiting standpoint, if any, any kids are going to sign late or... There, there is an expectation. Yes. Okay. So we prepare for that class coming in, when we sign kids late, there might be something in place that we can talk to them about. From an NCAA standpoint, is the institution going to move as quickly to ensure that the incoming freshmen are part of it? Has there been any discussion with that? A lot of that's going to depend on time frame. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that um, was brought up when, like I say, committees being formed and formed and, and dissolved, and, and one committee was supposed to be formed to meet in February, and uh, the, the NCA suggested, um, and the membership pointed out that there are sports that have a signing period coming up in February, and they'd really like some answers before their February signing period, which kind of caught the NCA off guard. So, um, you know, it's it's... Uh, you know, if you're talking about trying to sign someone in April and it's not until, um, you know, a committee that uh, meets in February and has discussions and has votes in their March meeting and that's when we find things out, maybe we institutionally won't have answers by April. I can't, can't guarantee you anything on that. Um, you know, and we know the, the 65 institutions that are driving the discussion right now. And unfortunately that puts all the rest of us in a wait and see pattern. So all we can do is respond on that there's not much proactively we can do right now. Well also too, then once the NCAA makes a decision, the conference has to make a decision as to where we're going. So yeah, so yeah, that was a, that's yeah, so another step in the process, right? We institutionally make a decision. Okay. Right. So we could be waiting on conference votes after the <coughs> NCAA votes to determine anything. Anything else on this? <coughs> okay, I'm um, going to move into this PowerPoint now, um, which is um, another, like we've done in some meetings, test. Uh, NCAA um, produced PowerPoint. So um, I just took it directly, and I'll, as some of the slides might not necessarily be active, we'll just skip over them, but it's. Uh, a uh, good PowerPoint about awards, um, benefits, and expenses. Always a good topic to review as it's um, the cause of many violations, you know, that involve awards and benefits um, legislation. So, um, you know, just 
quick recap because uh, you know obviously a lot of times we get into an expectation that everyone knows and there is but I'm just for a reminder because it's always good to have reminders um, you know uh, we have to be careful about extra benefits you know the NCAA defines the term for when a student athlete receives something uh, that is not <coughs> expressly permitted um, that they are receiving in any basis on their athletic ability or reputation so um, that's extra benefits. Extra benefits, um, you know, you as coaches could inadvertently, hopefully inadvertently, provide an extra benefit. Um, you know, we as administrative staff, any of us could provide, professors could provide an extra benefit, boosters could provide an extra benefit. So um, it is uh, very um, obviously something that's a big concern. Um, so I'm not going to go over the basics of extra benefits so much. This uh, presentation um, kind of uh, is in direct response to changing legislation from the last legislative cycle. So it's kind of focuses more on things that may be new or interpreted differently this year, but um, you know, rather than just a back to basics of awards and benefits. But hopefully all of you do have a, a basic understanding and um, you know, can ask me any questions if you don't, um, and we'll go through the slideshow. Um, all right, so awards. Um, are, uh, you know, what the student athlete can receive as awards, um, you know, making distinction between when they are not representing the institution <coughs> as opposed to when they are. Um, I should point out this whole slideshow refers to enrolled student athletes. So we're not talking about if you're recruiting a prospective student athlete, awards they may have won. This is for students, athletes who have already enrolled. Um, so um, when <coughs> not uh, representing the institution, um, this uh, I know getting into the bylaws isn't necessarily a coach is not here all the time, but um, it has been placed in bylaw 12 as opposed to bylaw 16. So um, when not representing the institution, it's considered strictly an amateurism issue, which is bylaw 12. Um, awards and extra benefits uh, fall into bylaw 16. Those are the things the institution will be provided, but the expectation if it's if the student athlete is not representing the institution in their competition, um, is that the institution really should not have any involvement. So it goes away from bylaw 16 and into bylaw 12. Um, so uh, everything must be governed by the amateur sports organ organization uh, that is running whatever the competition is. Obviously, if your student athlete is engaging in outside competition, not representing the institution, there is an expectation that they maintain amateurism status, so that competition is organized by an amateur body and they're not engaging in professional competition. Um, it is now permissible um, that <clears throat> gift cards can be awards that they receive. Obviously, still there's still the prohibition on any cash awards um, <coughs> other than uh, covering actual necessary expenses, um, but receiving an award of um, a gift card, provided that gift card is not directly redeemable for cash. Um, so the charts on the value limitations on what a student athlete can receive, um, those are the charts that are established in bylaw 16 that establish <coughs> specific dollar values that uh, cannot be exceeded for an award that a student athlete receives. Um, good point. Good time to point out that uh, when we talk about um, all these things, obviously you have to give the St. Francis disclaimer that we have limited budgets here. We all know that. So when we talk about NCAA maximums and things that might be permissible, it doesn't mean you're approved to do all of those things from a budget standpoint. Um, but anyway, back to the point in the PowerPoint, um, the charts that establish the maximum values, those are charts in bylaw 16. As we said, uh, this scenario plays out in bylaw 12, so those charts do not apply. Um, and, and, but still, of course, any cash award cannot exceed the actual and necessary expenses for the student athlete to engage in that activity. Um, so uh, they can receive other awards based on their performance or place finish um, that do exceed as long as those awards are not cash equivalents or not redeemable for cash. Right. While representing the institution, of course, this is when we're in bylaw 16, um, so uh, gift cards are still permitted when we represent the institution, provided they're not redeemable for cash, um, and there can be no cash awards at all, uh, not even anything having to do with 
um, natural necessary expenses. The reason being because we can already provide actual necessary expenses when they are represented in the institution, so they don't double get that uh, by us providing it, and then they get the cash award as well. So no cash awards when represented in the institution. Um, some general reminders that a cash award, um, and as a student athlete could not receive, so if it's not permissible, um, then it can't be forwarded to someone else on behalf of the student athlete. You know, saying, oh, if it's uh, you know outside competition, or uh, most likely it would be outside competition. So a student athlete, um, the organizing body offers a cash award. The student athlete qualifies or earns that award, but knows they can't accept it. They can't set up an arrangement for it to be transferred to someone else on their behalf. It just needs to forfeit that award. Um, specific provision for the MIT tournament, um, that's only a technicality because the legislation talks about NCAA postseason, which technically the MIT is not, um, but that only applies to one sport. Um, the student athlete may not sell or exchange uh, for another item of value any item received for athletics participation. Um, so, uh, you know, when you issue an award, the student athlete can't Obviously, you can't get cash. The student athlete can't then get cash by just selling that award. <coughs> um, and student athlete is permitted uh, to receive um, a medal of nominal value uh, for recognition of an accomplishment in a particular event. Um, this, um, you know, always was allowed in some ways, but this makes more clear things like uh, game balls um, for a specific accomplishment or even just for being player of the week or, um, you know, providing the ball that someone scored a milestone, something or another with is now clearly permissible because of this. All right, so some case studies to get into. Um, when a student athlete participates in an improved, outside, unattached competition, and it's over holiday break. The student athlete won the race uh, for the overall race winner awards and for specific age group awards. The institution would like to know whether the student athlete is subject to the $400 limit um, for participation in other established meets uh, featured in figure 16-1. So any track and field want to chime in on this? Uh, yeah. I would say there are limits of four dollars per event, correct? No. no. <laughs> because that 16-1 is the chart they're referencing. This is outside competition, so um, it's uh, not subject to the charts in bylaw 16 um, anymore. It's being strictly limited, uh, strictly uh, the bylaws in 12 that apply. Um, <coughs> So it must conform to the rules of the amateur sports organization. So um, if the prizes exceeded that value established in the 16 chart, but they were advertised prior to the event as exceeding that value, then it's perfectly fine. Now, where we, uh, you still could run into problems um, for it being considered an extra benefit is if, uh, you know, once a high profile NCAA student athlete ended up being the winner, they increased the prize pool because they wanted to give extra to that person knowing that they were a college student who doesn't have endorsement deals or any professional contracts or anything. Then it wouldn't actually be, uh, in that scenario, wouldn't be considered subject um, to the uh, conforming to the rules of the amateur sports organization. They'd just be making up the rules on the fly in that case. But if uh, if it exceeds the values, it's no problem because it's not <coughs> institutional and those maximum values only apply to the institution now. Alright, case study number two. Um, an institution would like to know if it is permissible to give participation, out, participation awards out more than once a year. Um, since uh, we know that the bylaw was changed that said that a participation award can only be given once and at the end of the year, um, they said it doesn't have to be at the end of the year anymore, so can a participation award be given multiple times? Anyone have any thought about if that would be permissible or not? Brewer says yes, I think it would be permissible to give multiple participation awards at different <coughs> times throughout the year. 
Well, I would think so. I think football gives out things that, like a, you know, championship game, and then a bowl game, and then another championship game, and. You know, you guys can do that? Yes, it is permissible. <laughs> Corey is correct. Um, it is permissible to give awards, but the, uh, the, since this is institutional, the maximum value does apply, and now it becomes cumulative. So if you give multiple awards throughout the year, then you need to combine the values to determine that you're still under the maximum, not just have each individual award under the maximum, but you give it out once a week just under the maximum and it adds up to way over the maximum. All right, case study three. Um, so a team received a national championship uh, ring uh, for winning the championship. So um, during her weekly eBay check, the compliance officer discovered that one of those national championship rings was on the online auction site. Um, so the compliance officer um, pulled in the student athlete, had them take down the item. Um, was there a violation in this case? No one has changed hands, so there's no violation. Okay. I don't know. That's where it stands. People think that that's right, or are they concerned that a student was attempting to get something of value? Okay, I guess we're letting Rory speak for everyone, and he is correct. Um, it's not a violation because compliance caught it first. Obviously, it would be if a sale went through, um, but uh, compliance caught it first and prevented the violation from occurring. So, good job on the compliance office. Um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> Talking about some entertainment expenses permitted. Um, so entertainment uh, falls under bylaw 16 as well. Um, as we know from a couple of years ago now that uh, reasonable entertainment is permitted in conjunction with practice and competition. Any practice, any competition used to just be away competition. Now home or away and practices of course are almost always going to be at the institution, but you can still provide entertainment. Um, can be provided by the conference or by um, the institution. Um, so those are the permissible sources to provide entertainment. Uh, cash cannot be provided. Um, even if you're not letting the student athletes keep the cash, you can't put cash in their hands and say, um, you know, go do your entertainment, keep receipts, give me the change so I know that the money was spent in the right way. You can't put the cash in their hands for this sort of entertainment that's permissible. Um, and it's specifically only permitted during your declared playing and practice season, which means the 20 hour segment or segments, if you have one. Um, but this provision is not allowed when you're in eight hours. What? Well, I guess declared, you said during 20 hours. So Christmas break went out within 20 hours. So is that permitted entertainment during Christmas break? <laughs> That's, I guess that's, it's within our practice and play, but yeah. it's also not, we're not within 20 hours. So. You're not in 20 hours only by technicality if you don't have an hour limit, but right. you're in the quote unquote 20 hour segment your sport is. Um, so, yes, it is permissible. Um, it's not permissible to provide expenses for your team to scout a future opponent, so you can't say that, um, you know, your. Uh, watching your sport is entertainment, which is a valid argument, but really what you're doing is having your team, you know, watch how your future opponent plays live to scout them and get a competitive advantage, that's not permissible. Um, also, a student athlete may receive reasonable entertainment when representing the institution in a non-competitive event. So, we said in the last slide, or two slides ago, whatever, uh, that any practice or competition, um, we could provide entertainment. Uh, also, any non-competitive event in which the student athlete is representing the institution, um, such as, uh, for example, uh, Dasha taking student athletes to Apple Conference or something like that. Um, if they want to provide entertainment along with that, um, that would be fine. Um, student athlete cannot miss class uh, for the entertainment activities. All right, so 
with an institution hosting the football conference championship contest um, and asked that it could purchase game tickets for their uh, student athletes to attend the game as entertainment. Um, this could apply to any student athletes. The, the case study doesn't specify the football student athletes. So um, it's really a question for anyone. Um, do you think when hosting a conference championship in one sport that we can give our student athletes complimentary admission into that competition? Yes. Yep. Yes, you would think so? Yep. If we host a soccer championship yeah. here as we did, our student athletes could attend it for you, correct? Is that, is that, is that a C rule or is that a uh, NCAA rule? Or is got it again. Um, the NEC specifically permits, uh, for example, you said when we host the soccer championship, the NEC permits any Northeast Conference student, even if they travel from another school, to have free admission to that event. Um, and they don't even have to be athletes. Any NEC student um, can come and just show their student ID. Um, so it's not really athletically based at all. Um, but for this, the reason the answer is no um, is because of a specific <laughs> bylaw uh, that allows the institution to provide admission to any student athletes, to any institutions, any other sport events for regular in-season home competition. Uh, because of that exact verbiage that says regular in-season home competition, um, the regular part is what they say is not satisfied because um, postseason is considered a special event, not part of your regular season events. Okay, so an institution uh, asked that its football coaching staff to provide entertainment to the football student athletes by taking them to the movies outside of the playing and practice season. Um, is this permissible? I'm not even going to ask. It should be obviously no because it says outside of the season. Um, what about during spring practice? Any football coaches? What do you think about during spring practice? Right. There's, there's no competition in football spring season, but during their spring practice, um, it doesn't exactly follow the 20-hour model that other sports do, but it's considered essentially the same thing um, as you know a sport like soccer's spring schedule. So, um, so you are permitted um, in that time period that is declared as your spring practice time period. Um, Right. Um, Just a reminder, there's a departmental form for pre-approval for any entertainment, so you need to make sure you do that. To get yeah. Approval. Um, so if you do want to, uh, you know, don't just leave this meeting and think that now you can do things like so that was permissible, so you're just going to go ahead and do it. Of course, always ask before you act. Um, and fill out the appropriate paperwork, uh, which means it needs to get compliance approval, and then get to your sport administrator's approval um, before you actually engage in the activity. And budget approval. And that, is that only if our budgets are paying for it? No, that, that would be, even if you are... Um, if, they, if we're on a trip and the kids are paying for their own movie to go to, we have to get approval from you for them to attend the movie that they're paying for? No, that no, that that would be that. Then we're not providing anything. Okay. Yeah, so I like thought you meant like, like the bus isn't taking us to the movie theater, you know. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean that your your everything that the bus is going to be providing should be. I mean, it should be on the itinerary that gets approved before you leave. Um, where the bus is going to take you. But if you're staying in a hotel that's you know part of a or right next to a big shopping center and they've got, you know, shops where they want to go shopping and, or um, go get, uh, go to a movie theater and there or any other arcade or anything, then that's just them on their own doing it. But uh, if we're setting up their entertainment and in any way facilitating it, um, then it should get approved. Can coaches pay? Like personally out of pocket? Um, well, the bylaw specifies that the permissible sources um, are the conference or the institution. So basically, um, if it's a budgetary concern and you just want to make that donation to your sport, it, rather than paying out of pocket, you do have to go through that extra step. And 
um, expenses for practice and competition. Of course, um, we can provide any actual necessary expenses or to represent the institution in practice and competition, um, which includes incidental activities um, and travel expenses. Uh, student athlete must be eligible for competition in order to receive the expenses. So, um, of course, if you have a student athlete who's ineligible for whatever reason, uh, whether it's academics, whether it's a grade just not posting yet and they're going to be eligible, whether it's an NCAA reason that they became ineligible for a violation, something like that, if they are not eligible, uh, could be a residence requirement. If they are not eligible to compete, you can't say, well, we're going to bring them along um, but we know we can't compete them because then you're providing expenses to them that are impermissible. Um, and uh, athletics equipment at the end of their career that um, has become worn down, uh, we can just let them keep now. Um, we don't have to calculate depreciation value and all that stuff anymore. Um, So it's not permissible to provide expenses to travel for conditioning <laughs> activities outside the playing season. Um, so uh, the reason this specifically comes up, I you know it's not really a scenario that comes up much other here, but because um, the mileage limits were taken away for where you can practice. Um, so you could go hold a practice basically wherever you want to go hold a practice, um, but you, outside the season you can't go somewhere else um, to do conditions, well, you could go somewhere else, but your student athletes would have to get there by themselves because uh, you cannot provide expenses um, to do outside of the season uh, conditioning activities. Um, specific NCAA championship provisions, um, and may um, not provide expenses to prospective student athletes, of course. We're not even talking about prospective student athletes today. So, um, another case study an institution asked if it could now pay for parking passes for the student athletes um, as an incidental expense related to competition or practice. Um, so, um, maybe some institutions, maybe uh, some bigger campuses where the student dorms are nowhere near their practice facilities and they need to park at a specific lot near the practice facility or at least that's the argument the school would make and they say so can we pay for their parking because that's incidental to competition um, and it is permissible um, provided uh, it's not simply um, an unlimited parking class that they can use in, in uh, any situation or for other events um, so it would have to be a very specific scenario um, where, uh, like I just described, you know, not applicable to a school like us, but um, there might be scenarios where it might be permissible um, if the school can make a strong enough argument for why a specific limited parking pass is necessary for athletic participation. Um, is it permissible for an institution to pay the TSA pre-check fee um, for student athletes um, before a flight? And then uh, it, it could be considered if, they, if the institution can make the argument that those are necessary expenses for the team to fly, for the student athletes um, to fly, then it can be considered an incidental expense um, of participation. All right, so now we've got an institution competing in Las Vegas before winter break. Um, some student athletes requested to stay in Las Vegas extra days, uh, and the institution would still like to pay for their return flight to campus. Um, so basically the idea would be the institution from their end doesn't feel like they're paying anything more. They were going to fly them to Las Vegas and back either way. All they're doing is delaying the return flight. And now the institution does have the discretion to do such a thing. Um, of course, in the past we had hour limits about how long before competition you could start providing expenses and how long after you could continue. That's been done away with. It's now institutional discretion um, for, uh, and uh, to provide flexibility um, in travel. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, now we talk a little bit about non-competitive events, um, and the institution uh, can provide actual necessary expenses, um, can also provide reasonable entertainment, um, which again can come from the conference or from the institution. Um, student athletes uh, can always receive reasonable local transportation on an occasional basis. Of course, um, what constitutes local has been a point of contention for us. So this, you do not have the authority on your own to decide that when you drive a student athlete somewhere, it's reasonable and local. You have to check with the compliance office first. Um, and of course, cash can never be provided. All right, so with an institution holding its regular annual sports banquet, and it's going to have a media event for all the seniors. Um, so the institution wants to know if we can provide appropriate clothing for